my name is Nadia Baer and I'm a postdoc in Digital Humanities and American Studies. So my project is called The Decisive Network, Magnum Photos in the Post-War Image Market, and it's related to my book manuscript, which is a history of the photo agency Magnum. So something that I was really interested in is Magnum is really known for a couple of its famous photographers and it's their iconic images that they produced. And what I was interested in doing is a couple of things. First, based on the archival research that I did, showcasing the labor of other staff who helped the photographers become famous and who helped them produce their work. So the largest this view here is dedicated to really bringing to life um, people like secretaries and editors, people who worked behind the scenes on editing Magnum Films and distributing Magnum Films. Um, another par part of the project that I'm interested in doing is showing how agents, sales agents, um, sold Magnum's pictures around the world. So. There, the idea is to have a, a map of the world showing how post after World War II magazine markets emerged um, and how Magnum was servicing those markets with his pictures. And then the third part is to pick a couple of um, iconic photo stories and to, um, to show how they also circulate around the world. And the intervention there is, especially in the United States, we often think about um, photojournalism histories as being about Life magazine. And the, role, the goal here is to show that these photographers were selling to a whole variety of markets and that they were actually influencing global visual culture and not just American visual culture with the pictures they were producing. Yeah. It's um, been really great to collaborate with the Digital Humanities Lab um, at Yale, particularly because um, I found that a lot of the pre-existing software on network visualization um, sort of all looked the same and, and put you into a mold of having to represent networks in a particular kind of 21st century way. And what I really wanted to do um, was to represent these networks and these ideas in the style of post-war visual culture. So um, the designer, Monica Henri, on read, um, I showed her some of the um, publicity materials that Magnum was creating about itself. And so what we've done is we've come up, she's come up with ways to model the presentation of this information on that mid-century visual culture. And that's really exciting to me. Yeah. The basis for the, for the project is a, is a tool to, to explore the testimonies of Holocaust survivors, witnesses, and bystanders um, from three different collections. Uh, the Fortune of Video Archive, which has is a collection of 4,500 testimonies, uh, the USC Shoah Foundation, and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Both the USC Shoah Foundation and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum have contributed uh, over a thousand testimony transcripts each to this project, and our collection combined with that um, comes to about 3,000 testimony transcripts. The anthology is very much um, a project that is similar to other sort of traditional historical work in which a body of text is explored and, and, and similar experiences are brought together uh, from those texts to explore uh, more, let's say, um, common, common experiences that survivors may have, may have um, met in, in the camps or uh, prior to or, or, or in the post-war period. Uh, the anthology, however, uses sophisticated uh, data text mining tools to, to explore this very large uh, amount of data in order to pull those common experiences together. The other aspect of this project is a search tool which allows researchers and educators to search across all of these 3,000 testimony transcripts in sophisticated ways to, to locate subjects related to their research topics. So there's really two sides to the project, the anthology and the search tool. The Fortune Off Video Archive um, and the DH Lab uh, have started a, a partnership beyond this project. This is our, our, our sort of first effort to working together uh, by bringing Gabra Toth, a postdoctoral associate. We're, we are funding the postdoctoral associate uh, and the DH Lab is working together with him to produce this project. But in addition to this, we're also looking to bring in um, a developer to work on additional Fortune Off uh, projects in the future. My name is Amanda Shemesh. I'm a dual degree master's student at Yale University. So I'm studying East Asian studies and American studies. But both of them have an interest in the history, the landscape, uh, and trauma that takes place in the landscape, and investigating that with digital media tools such as AutoCAD, Rhino, and Adobe Illustrator. So yeah, it's 
actually based off of Teju Cole's novel Open City, and the protagonist is Julius, and Julius is a Nigerian doctor at Columbia University who traverses the city and meditates on various events historically that have happened. And one of the main quotes of the book is that the site is a palimpsest, and a palimpsest is a document where things have been written on it and erased and rewritten, and you can find the imprint of, of those things from the past in, in that document. And when you think about atrocity and the development of Manhattan, you're like, you know, wait a minute, my, my fiancé is an architecture student and we're using exploded axons all the time. And what's a better document kind of expressor than an exploded axon to show the palimpsest of history? So we picked four, four points that Teju Cole talked about, which was pre-colonial Manhattan when it was occupied by the Algonquin Lenape, um, Dutch colonial Manhattan, we picked 1664 right on the cusp of when it was sold to the British, 1863 draft riots, and 2001 uh, the 9-11 attacks. And we really wanted to express two things. We wanted to talk about the fact that He's articulating all this information, but when you're talking about literature, you're cherry-picking pieces of information from within a broader archive, and we wanted to compare those two things. And in order to do that, we traced out his experiences. This is a programmatic axon, so that really shows these events layered on one another and then them separated by time. And at the same time, we recreated from historic maps these three-dimensional interactive spaces that have hot spots. And as you click on them, you open up the archive. So I wanted people to understand the wealth of information that he was tapping into and begin to actually explore these spaces. So it's kind of like time travel in four distinct periods. What I'm presenting here is a Python module. It's a software module, um, and it's designed for use inside of the Jupyter computational notebook format. And um, the idea is that uh, if you're a researcher who's working with a lot of image data, and in particular if you want to get sort of human eyes on the data, um, there are some very kind of concise ways of producing uh, montages of images. Let me show you an example of this. Um, sort of these montages of images, and they can be sorted according to um, visual properties of the images or according to like metadata variables like place and time. And, and so the idea is, in particular, if you're a researcher in the humanistic sciences and you want your human expertise to be the primary way of apprehending these images rather than sort of like machine perception, this enables you to get human eyes on your images in, in a fa fairly efficient way without having to leave the computational notebook format. One thing I've learned in the process of um, producing this software is uh, I had to um, try to strike a balance in, in this case between the kind of power of the tool, the the, um, and what I mean by that is um, the ability of the tool to do lots of different things, and then for it to be learnable by a fairly kind of uh, you know sort of a new audience that's learning it for the first time. Um, it can be a little overwhelming if the tool has like too many features, and so you want to strike a balance between kind of lots of features and something being learnable and sort of. Um, the user being able to conceptualize it fairly easily at the beginning, and so I decided on, you know, having just four or five very basic plotting functions, um, and that have a number of kind of options that you can change to adjust features of the plots, and I found that to be a fairly good balance. So there is a lot of power in there, but um, the tool is organized according to a very fairly, fairly simple model that I think the user can kind of learn right away. And so, you know. This originally was designed for the use case where maybe you're already coding in Python a little bit and you know a little bit of that stuff, but I think it could be an entry point for some people who want to learn that, but it's a little daunting and I think that this is kind of like a gentle entry into using Python and the notebook format. So, This was a collection of 300 or so tweets that we took. And what this is doing is reading the tweets in chronological order. And every time it comes across one of these uh, key words, it'll ping the bubble. And so the darker and larger the bubble, the more commonly it's seen. And it's really interesting because you can watch the composition of what's being talked about in the tweets as the movement is going through. And a couple of interesting things uh, were Calhoun was initially not something that was brought up in the tweets. It was initially a lot of master, a lot of slavery, a lot of civil rights. And then as the movement went on, we see a lot of uh, increased attention to community, to campus, to principles, 
okay. uh, that kind of thing. And so this was just a really interesting way to visualize what was happening in the evolution of the tweets. And so this is the same set of tweets, but instead what's happening is uh, here is sort of the first tweet chronologically, and then it goes around in this direction. And what you can do is you can sort of put your mouse over top of the words, and it'll map to where they appear in the tweet. So you can take a look at, um, for example, Yale. It's really prominent in the first couple of tweets, and then in the later sections it's not so prominent. Or students, um, more prominent in the later tweets than it is in the early tweets, that kind of thing. It's just another way to sort of visualize what's happening in the tweets. Uh, my name is Gina Hurley. I am a Medieval Studies PhD candidate. My name is Eric Insley, and I'm a PhD student in the English department. So we are presenting an edition that was developed during a uh, graduate student workshop, the Digital Editing and the Manuscript Role Workshop, uh, which we've now hosted at several institutions. Um, Yes, and it's a two-day workshop, and we invite graduate students and librarians, uh, basically anybody studying anything having to do with the med medieval period, uh, to come to our workshop, and we train them to do XML and TEI. And so over the course of the workshop, they design and implement code for a digital edition of a role. And we are hosting that on our uh, website right now, and we're running through our beta version of our platform, and we will have an archive of about we have about 10 roles right now that we've done, and we'll be hosting uh, all those roles online. So it's collaborative code, basically. Yeah. So manuscript roles are unusual objects, uh, and so trying to find a way to do justice to the actual physical materiality of a manuscript role, uh, when most of, most, of our, um, most of the existing markup languages are thinking about codices, uh, books as opposed to this, you know, strange long object that you have to unroll and interact with in this really um, interesting way. Thinking about a way that our editions can do justice to the materiality of a manuscript is, is something that we've been really interested in. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nathan Lin, and I'm an undergraduate computer science major at Yale. So I'm working on a project that involves making 3D models of some stone tablets that we have at Yale. So actually, sorry, in the art gallery, we have these stone reliefs from the Northwest Palace in Nimrud, so ancient Babylon. And one motivation for this project is, of course, in the last couple of years, uh, ISIS is presumed to have destroyed this palace. Um, so one thing we want to do is to work on creating models of our existing tablets so that we have some kind of preservation of them. And another aspect that I'm working on is, is trying to provide the viewers with an experience that they wouldn't be able to get from just going to the art gallery and looking at the tablets. So here's like my, one, my 3D model of, of the tablet and one of the things that I was working on is, well, the lighting we have right now is really different from the lighting back 3,000 years ago. So, of course, the tablet's going to look different if it's lit by modern lights versus if it's lit by what they probably had, a torch light. So I've been working on some different models of illumination using fire. Um, so, so like the viewer would be able to cycle through these different kinds of lighting and get a better idea of what these tablets look like. And one portion that I'm currently working on where this effective lighting is really going to make a difference is that I'm working on trying to reconstruct what the original coloring of these tablets would look like because these tablets were all originally painted 3,000 years ago. If you go to the art gallery, the other tablet, you, at the art gallery you can actually see like some red still on the feet of, of the tablet. So we're working on work, talking to art historians and conservationers, conserva conser conservators on what colors the tablet would have looked like back then. And that's where the lighting is really going to make a big difference because different colors are going to look really different under different kinds of lighting because it's most likely that the kinds of colors they're using would look very garish today under normal lighting, but under fire lighting they'd be much more subdued, subdued and a more uh, aesthetically pleasing kind of uh, image.